How's that hold? That music, like lift music. There you go. That's the sign. Well, good evening, good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you at the back who wish to join us, please, please come into the room. You can bring your glasses, <coughs> take a seat. Um, my name's Mark Littlewood. I'm the Director General here at the IA, at least for another few weeks. I'm looking forward to handing over to Tom Cloperty, hopefully a little before Christmas. And I'm delighted to be with you today to welcome back uh, a good friend of the Institute and of Freedom in general in general, the Honourable Joe Hockey, who, as you know, served as Treasurer of Australia from 2013 to 2015, then went on to be the 21st Australian Ambassador to the United States of America. He was a member of the Australian Parliament for over 20 years, was appointed to numerous senior cabinet roles, including Minister for Workplace Relations, Minister for Human Services, and Minister for Small Business and Tourism. He is now the founding partner and global president of Bondi Partners, a strategic advisory firm with a presence in Australia, the US and here in the United Kingdom. Going back to the, more or less, the start of my tenure at the IEA, well, uh, a couple of years into it, in April 2012, Joe, then shadow treasurer uh, in New Zealand, you delivered a speech to the Institute of Economic Affairs uh, here in London entitled The End of the Age of Entitlement. And it is uh, fair to say that your comments at that time about the unsustainable nature of universal welfare entitlements had been ignored for years, and that speech was widely judged as one of the most important speeches given by any Australian politician in the last 100 years. Sure as hell made one heck of a splash. Uh, I, I hope that you're going to be revisiting some of those uh, themes again today, whether we are really now at the final tail end of the age of entitlement. Uh, <laughs> ten years ago we were at the end. Is, is, is this the epilogue? Um, uh, or, or is there to be a sequel? Uh, but it's great to have you back um, uh, uh, just a decade later, again here at the IEA to revisit this thesis uh, in the context of ongoing global economic challenges uh, delighted to welcome you back, Joe, and he's going to discuss the future of our global economy and the role of governments in the wake of recent events. Please join me in giving an extremely warm welcome to the Honourable Joe Hockey. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming along tonight. It's, uh, it's a great honour to be invited back to the Institute uh, of Economic Affairs after an interlude of more than 10 years to offer a sequel, in this case, to my last major speech here about the end of the age of entitlement. I have uh, some trepidation, I must say. Back to the Future 2 <laughs> was a major sequel box office flop. <laughs> In many ways, I am going back to the future. Perhaps when it comes to ending entitlements, it's more about Mission Impossible, which, in fact, uh, ironically came up with seven films in the end, so we could be here for a while. Now, the reasons for a discussion about the role of society-wide government entitlements remains as urgent as ever. Whilst we may feel as though we have lost the war on entitlements and government spending, there is hope that, through innovation, we can restrain the worst of ourselves and thus give the generations beyond a better quality of life. My speech more than a decade ago on unrestrained government spending went unheeded. I warned back then that, the quote, the reality can no longer be avoided. Government spending programs must be wound back. To vainly quote myself again, the problem arises when there is a belief that one person has a right or service that someone else will pay for. It is this sense of entitlement that afflicts not only individuals but also entire societies. And governments are to blame for betraying taxpayers' money as something removed from the labour of another person. In over a decade, nothing has changed. In fact, the problem is deeper and has become more entrenched than ever, as intergenerational dependency takes a grip on government spending. Most governments are spending more, taxing more and borrowing more than a decade ago. And this has fuelled higher inflation. And inflation is effectively an indiscriminate tax that makes rich people with assets richer and the rest of the community poorer. 
As John Maynard Keynes noted, by continuing a process of inflation, governments can confiscate, secretly and unobserved, an important part of the wealth of their citizens. Lower-income families tend to spend everything they earn on the essentials of life, from housing and food to fuel and shelter. When those prices go up because of inflation, there is no compensation. They can demand higher wages and more welfare, but employers and governments are slow to respond, knowing that higher wages in turn fuel higher inflation. When Milton Friedman, arguably the most significant economist of the last half century, died in 2006, he was lauded by presidents and prime ministers, central bankers and business leaders as well. They all lauded him for his wisdom. He described inflation as an old, old disease. We have had thousands of years of experience of it, he said. And he added that the only cure for inflation is to reduce the rate at which total spending is growing. Friedman argued that increasing interest rates is the best solution for reducing money in the economy. It is, however, as I know, a very blunt instrument. The more governments spend, the higher interest rates will go in a full employment economy. We need to have fiscal and monetary policy walking in the same direction. On that formula, we are failing. Since I was last at the Institute, the United States has increased its general government spending from 39% of GDP to 45% last year. The United Kingdom has increased the size of government from 44% to 48% in the same period, and Australia from 38% to 42%. Even taking into account the impact of COVID-19, governments are much larger today than they were a decade ago. And that growth is overwhelmingly funded by more debt. We are borrowing money from our children to pay for our entitlements today. Since 2012, government debt in the United Kingdom has increased by nearly 25%. In the US, by 40%. And in Australia, net debt has nearly tripled as a percentage of GDP. In Australia, both the global financial crisis and COVID-19 took us from zero net government debt to our current position. We paid off in the Howard government all net government debt, so we were debt free. However, in the last few years, the Australian government is starting to pay down some of its new debt by running a budget surplus based on higher tax collections. Whatever the political response is, the basic challenges for our societies have not changed. The demographic trends of an ageing population have not changed. Apart from the horror of COVID-19, the health and education trends of the past 10 years have not changed. Even the terrible wars in Ukraine and the Middle East have had minimal impact on Western government spending. And unquestionably, climate change has made a difference, but from a government budget perspective, it has not been a materially significant issue. At, and this, all this, and we still have no resolve to live within our means. Tragically, populism is rampant and clearly uncontrollable. Following my speech here, I went on to become Treasurer of Australia. And in 2014, I delivered a federal budget that had an economically modest impact. It offered a medium-term reduction in real government spending. It had a number of initiatives that were focused on targeted savings and the concept of people with adequate income paying their own way for services. For example, we proposed a $5 co payment for a patient visiting their doctor. Until then, it was deemed free. A safety net was put in place for 6 million Australian concession card holders. Well, the critics said it was the end of time. Journalists pandered as unfair, mean and elitist. And even the Australian Medical Association criticised the initiative. This week, in Australia, the same Australian Medical Association has recommended the standard GP consultation fee go up to over $100 per visit, leaving patients, after the Australian Government rebate, 
out of pocket for more than $40 a visit. Believe that. Till this day, the budget is still panned as unpopular. It's naive and absurd to measure the popularity of a federal budget. Spending money may be popular, but saving money is not. That's why governments borrow money, and that's why they spend it. Painless popularity, the necessary evil of short election cycles. Western democracies have fallen into the deep abyss of populism that makes hard decisions between regular elections almost impossible. I don't need to remind you here in the UK of that challenge. For perspective, the National Health Scheme is a signature example. After the British monarchy, I'm assured it's the most loved entity in the United Kingdom. <laughs> in fact, it might even be more loved than the British monarchy. I don't know. However, it is, from all reports, close to broken. With a waiting list of 7 million patients and 2.5 million Britons off work each week because they are sick, the goals of the NHS are not being met. Yet each year, even after taking into account the impact of COVID-19, the NHS becomes more and more expensive with poorer outcomes. Once again, an entirely publicly funded system with no means testing does not meet the community's needs and expectations. And yet it is politically toxic and I can see this from Australia. It's politically toxic to suggest that there should be an affordable means-tested co-payment to sustain and improve the NHS. Apparently, feeling good about a free entitlement is more important than the health outcomes. Once again, the people that lose out are the most in need. Wealthy people can get around the failures of a broken public health system by purchasing private medical treatment. Governments are scared to change entitlements. They fear losing elections. Even though I lost my job as Treasurer and Tony Abbott his job as Prime Minister in 2015, the coalition government we formed went on to win the next two elections in Australia. Along the way, most of the savings of my 2014 budget, from public sector program cuts to ending business subsidies, were implemented. Crucially, stricter means testing for welfare was implemented and cost controls on spending were delivered. Reductions in foreign aid, increases in fuel taxes, the abolition of failed industry programs and changes in the growth of spending in health, education and welfare paid for new expenditure in infrastructure, defence and the creation of an enduring medical research future fund. We closed open uh, open-ended public sector superannuation funds and we reduced the size of the public service by more than 15,000. Of course, to critics, it was a failure. It was not. It was simply unpopular. I give credit to my friend Matthias Cormann, who as Finance Minister subsequently delivered those changes until he retired in 2020. He is now Secretary General of the OECD. As each year passes, the challenges become more significant. Most governments of Western democracies have not only failed to rein in existing entitlement programs, they've added new initiatives. For example, in Australia, the National Disability Insurance Scheme was introduced in 2016. It was originally legislated before we even got into government back in uh, 2012. It was intended to be run with a $13 billion a year budget. A blowout saw it rise to $35 billion a year. It's now expected to be $50 billion a year in the next four years, becoming Australia's most expensive social program. Of course, there's little argument against doing all we can to help disabled Australians. It is and should be a way to better health and employment outcomes across society. However, it is not adequately funded by new taxes and the gap is turning into a medium-term budget nightmare for the Labor government. To their credit, they are responding to the challenge. However, the options are limited. Either we borrow from future generations to pay for the funding gap, or we apply proper means testing on services with a view to make the safety net sustainable. 
there is also just a glimmer of hope in Washington, D.C. Last year, the Democrat-controlled Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which committed an additional $433 billion in new spending on pharmaceuticals and climate change initiatives. To their credit, Congress fully funded the spending. And even though I can't get excited about increased taxes, in the absence of new savings, at least they raised taxes by $739 billion to pay for it, thus reducing the deficit by more than $300 billion. Of course, as you know, tax increases are a handbrake on economic growth. As Margaret Thatcher so eloquently stated, any government that has high taxation is giving itself more power and the people less. The only alternative to increasing tax is to either postpone the burden by borrowing more money today or to spend less. And spending less is clearly not happening. The political irony in the United States is that the fiscal lectures come from the Republicans. But the last administration to live within its means was the Clinton administration. That Congress delivered a $122 billion budget surplus in, 2020, in 2001. In fact, since that time, consistent budget deficits have blown out American government debt by an extraordinary $28 trillion. The party that voted against the legislation, the Republican Party, has been screaming about rising debt levels of the US government. But when they were in control of the White House, the House of Representatives and the Senate, the US deficits grew larger and the US government debt grew bigger. In 2000, US government debt was $5 trillion or 33% of GDP. Today it's $33 trillion, 121% of GDP. Why the ballooning debt? Because it's too hard politically to stop borrowing money. They all run the political charades of implementing a debt ceiling or closing down the government because it has run out of money. That's base political opportunism. The reality is that with a crucial congressional election every two years, no one wants to make a hard decision on limiting spending. You would think that a president who is required to retire at the end of their two-year term, their, their two, second term, may be prepared to do what's right. However, unlike our beloved Westminster system, the president in the United States has little control over the budget. It's mostly in the hands of the legislature. While the Congress has borrowing costs with zero interest rates for the last few years, they didn't hesitate to borrow more money and spend more money. Buy now, pay later not only came, became a retail form of finance, it's used by every government. Its utility facilitated more spending and even paid for tax cuts. However, the chickens have now come home to roost. This year, the US budget deficit blew out to an unbelievable $2 trillion, double the budget deficit of last year. To put it in perspective, the US budget will spend $6.3 trillion this year and nearly one third of that will be paid by debt, the rest by taxes. And that's in a budget friendly environment where there's no recession and the US has full employment. Yet for American taxpayers, the budget will deteriorate as interest rate rises increase. So the cost of government debt to the bottom line increases as well. By 2025, so that's just two years' time, the interest alone on US government debt will cost more than the entire defence budget. By 2026, a year later, the US government will spend more on interest repayments on its debt than it spends on Medicare. America is strangling itself with debt. Perhaps they think they can follow the lead of the United Kingdom from the 1950s and beyond. Over those three decades, the UK let inflation rip. And it's hard to believe when you do the research on this and come up with this sort of information. In 1950, peak debt uh, in the UK was a massive 270% of GDP. It dropped to around 50% by 1978. Why? Because the UK government kept inflation higher than the interest rates on their debt. So inflation in the form of higher and higher taxes and inflated economy helped pay down the debt. 
That, of course, is a false economy, as we noted earlier, because inflation is a backdoor tax on the community. In short, it was the British people that paid a massive price. When Margaret Thatcher was elected to office, the top tax rate on incomes was 83%. The top tax rate on savings was 98%. And all that time, inflation was a further tax on the British people. It's not the answer for 2023. Yet, on top of all this, we have our structural challenges. Populations across the Western world are ageing. Climate change still represents the greatest threat to our planet's environmental sustainability for thousands of years. And the global power struggle between populism and good government has resulted in trade tensions and a rise in economic protectionism. If that's not enough, the spectre of a wide-scale conflict grows more concerning each day as the familiar old partnership of authoritarianism and nationalism yet again raises its ugly head. In 2012, my warning to communities was that we had to curb the entitlement culture in order to make our lives sustainable in a complicated world. Nothing's changed. Today, I am warning our legislators and leaders that it is their sense of entitlement that is the problem. The entitlement to hold on to power. The entitlement to be popular, no matter what the cost. Political leaders are afraid of hard decisions when everything can be bought with borrowed money. That sense of entitlement, that you can give people everything they want, is a cancer in our community, and we will pay a price. So, Mark, I really didn't want this speech to turn into a bad Hollywood sequel. <laughs> apparently, uh, and again, this is the better for the Google, uh, apparently the very worst movie sequel of all time was The Exorcist 2, <laughs> called The Heretic. So let us evict the evil spirits and focus on some things that continue to give us hope. And nothing is more exciting than the capacity of our fellow human beings to innovate. Our collective desire to live longer, to be happier, to have a better quality of life drives innovation. And that innovation has made a material difference to our society. With innovation and money, we can respond to the greatest challenges of our times. And nothing in my lifetime can match what human humanity achieved in its medical response to COVID-19. At that time, I was living in Washington, D.C. through COVID. In Operation Warp Speed, the public-private program to rapidly develop a vaccine for COVID-19, was an unprecedented partnership between private innovation, government funding and regulator flexibility. On scale and outreach, there was nothing in the world could match this initiative. Backed by $18 billion of government funding, Operation Warp Speed helped get the world back on its feet and saved millions and millions of lives. It funded and accelerated vaccines from Johnson & Johnson, Moderna and Novavax. It even funded $1.2 billion to the groundbreaking Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine, for which in Australia we were very appreciative of the contribution of the UK government. And the US provided those funds, even though that vaccine in particular wasn't even used in the United States. Even the Pfizer vaccine, which was part funded by the German government, received billions of dollars from the US government for production and distribution around the world. The money alone was not a panacea. We had the very best researchers and medical specialists all around the world working to accelerate their existing research to find a vaccine to save lives. In response to the challenge, nations across the earth, from China and Russia to the United States, the United Kingdom and Europe, gave away billions of doses of vaccines to poorer nations. Non-government organisations joined with national and multinational agencies to administer vaccines to the poorest and most inaccessible people on earth. It wasn't perfect, but for a brief moment, in the face of a momentous challenge to the entire world community, we all stood tall. We saved our world from its greatest modern challenge. In 2023, innovation has no limits. We often think of how innovation has made goods and services more example. For example, how would we have coped if we didn't have online retailers during COVID-19? And social media made information more accessible to more people in time of pandemic, war and climate change. 
In 1789, Benjamin Franklin declared that nothing is certain except death and taxes. I agree that taxes are around forever. However, with new innovations, perhaps death is not as enduring. An esteemed, an esteemed Australian biologist based at Harvard University, Professor David Sinclair, believes that ageing is a disease that can be cured. He and his small team of researchers have worked for years on fixing what he calls the glitch of ageing, and they've had success. In 2020, Sinclair and his team were able to restore vision to old mice by injecting their eyes with a specially designed virus that reverses the degrading effects of age on its eyesight. He and his team then took the research a step further, being able to partially turn back the biological clocks in multiple other organs of mice they prematurely aged. And then earlier this year, they made a significant jump to primates. Using the same therapeutic technique, they were able to significantly improve the visual function in a primate's eye which had been damaged from a disorder similar to a stroke of the eye. Sinclair and his team believe that eye diseases are just the beginning. He hopes to be able to stall and even reverse ageing within people by applying the same therapy to the other organs that naturally malfunction with age. While this field of scientific inquiry feels as though we were venturing into the realm of fiction, we're on the path to discovering the fountain of youth. But this discovery is illustrative of a broader economic and demographic trend. We are living longer and healthier lives. The average Australian lifespan is currently around 83 years old. We're expected to live closer to 90 by the year 2062, when the number of citizens over 65 will be more than double today. Many countries in the Western world are experiencing a similar demographic trend. EU countries have among the highest proportion of over 65s. Well, in 2012, 18% of the population was over 65. Ten years on, it's 21%. That also means there's fewer workers if people are not going to keep working. If Dr Sinclair gets his way, we'll be seeing our 110th or 120th birthdays or longer still. I suspect they might run out of presents by that stage. Unfortunately, this creates an impossible paradox. We can't live longer, expect more and pay less for it. Without a recalibration, we will simply saddle our children with debt that will starve them of their futures. The road back to living within our means is hard. However, the pressures of the modern world and ageing populations will require a fundamental reformation of the social contract between governments and its citizenry a fundamental shift in expectation. Not only are we on track to spend more and more of our future generation's money, we're also planning on sticking around for longer to breathe their oxygen. Isn't that the ultimate act of selfishness? <laughs> and perhaps the greatest claim of entitlement? I'm certainly not advocating what we want to stop... I'm not advocating that we want to stop the march of human evolution and scientific progress. But we also want to have a modicum of selflessness. And that means living within our means by becoming a selfless rather than a selfish society. And having the boldness to lead a rediscovery of the language of small government, that should be compelling in today's electorate. It is unending work bringing to an end the age of entitlement. And we should not be discouraged by setbacks and hurdles. It won't be a painless journey I know that from my own personal political experiences over the last decade. But let me tell you and promise you it's worth the pain. We should all strive to give those that follow us the best shot at life. I'm personally not sure about David Sinclair's desire to end ageing. Growing older encourages us to build a life and pass on lessons to our children. Hopefully that leaves the world a better place. We are at risk of self-destruction if we not only continue to live well beyond our means, but we also try and live forever. So I, for one, would probably not drink from the fountain of youth should I be given the opportunity. I think it's the reasonable thing to do. Thank you very much.
Joe, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you. Let me just tell you how things will map out from here. Uh, I've got a, a, a good number of questions I want to ask you, following on from your, uh, your, your terrific speech there. Then I'm going to go to the floor to take interventions uh, uh, from you guys, and we'll, we'll wrap up in about 40, 45 minutes, and then you can grab another uh, glass of something to drink. So, uh, fantastic analysis. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to have you back at the IEA. Um, I guess I've got, I've literally written down a string of questions on, on the basis of what you've said. And I, I want to start with uh, just a straightforward prediction. Uh, put aside how compelling your argument might be or whether Aussies or Brits would vote for it. Uh, one of the mottos I've led my life by is the great, th the great thing about things which are not sustainable is that they are not sustained. And if the scale of government spending and borrowing and all the rest of it isn't sustainable, then um, it will end at some point. Uh, you mentioned in your speech the <coughs> huge amount that's now being spent just on repaying debt, on servicing debt. I shouldn't say repaying debt, merely servicing debt. I think in the UK now, that's around about the entire state education budget, maybe yeah. a bit lower, maybe a bit uh, higher. Uh, you're mentioning the comparison with defence and Medicaid in the United States of America. So my first question is, almost, do we have anything to worry about or will maths just take its course? That, that at some point it will be recognised that, you know, we've borrowed too much and there will just have to be a nat natural correction, irrespective of any kind of ideological or economic point, just it's not sustainable, so it will have to stop whatever arguments are put forward. So, <clears throat> I'm not name dropping here, but um, Mike Milken, the famous mm. Uh, mm. Drexel Burnham banker from uh, the 80s, and everyone remembers him. I uh, met him many years ago. And, That's definitely um, name dropping. It is. <laughs> yeah, well, it is. Depends. He's <laughs> up and down. He's been to jail and various other things. But um, he, uh, not that there's anything wrong with that apparently, but um, he, uh, he, I said, you know, what were the 80s like? He said they were fantastic. I said, how did you earn your money? He said, I earned a billion dollars a year. And he came, I said, holy cow, how did you earn that? And he said, well, every six months I'd meet with the other heads of the banks, Citibank and, uh, you know, Wells Fargo and so on, and they'd say, Mike, why aren't you lending money to South American governments? And he said, well, because they could default. And they said, no, they're not going to default. Governments don't default. Mm -hmm. And, of course, what he did was, when they defaulted, he went and bought all the debt from the other banks mm -hmm. for six, ten cents in the dollar. And then he'd go and convert it into equity somehow and then he'd make his billions. So governments can default. Uh, the question is, how much pain are you prepared to take before you do? And how committed are you to not defaulting? So Australia's credit rating, I, can't, I confess I'm not sure about the UK, but Australia's credit rating is higher than the US. Australia's AAA. Mm -hmm. And the US has lost it, right? And so the markets... The US keeps going because it's the US dollar. It's the default currency in the world. Until it's not. And you can see other countries starting to gather around alternate currencies. Uh, I think markets are more liquid and wider and broader than ever before. It can come to an end. And you, you, you saw it graphically when Liz Truss became Prime Minister, the reaction in the market and the impact it had on politics, I think that's coming. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, I'm not wishing for a default because I can see... No, the pay of course. But it, that's the sort of limit we're going to come up against, right? And you, you, one might be able to paint a picture that one needs to go through that pain, that, uh, that perhaps we're underestimating the viability of a government. I mean, everybody says, by, you know, by guilts, oh, yeah. they're, they're the most secure <laughs> asset in the world, US guilts. I mean, were there to be, I'm not predicting this anytime soon, a default or at least a haircut, yeah. uh, then suddenly the governments across the Western world, for all of the popular reasons that you say, sort of jam today for the electorate and pain tomorrow, well, it becomes impossible to borrow more than you're bringing in in tax or, or, or very, very difficult, whereas low interest rates for endless years made that easy. We'll just kick the can down the road. Might not be a bad thing if, it, if, if that occurred, right? Well, the market plays out as the market plays out, but the, um, <coughs> it's quite ironic. Um, 
some legislators in the US say to me, oh, look, don't worry because our wealth is increasing, our asset base is increasing. I say, OK, when did you last sell an airport? Mm -hmm. When did you last privatise an airport? Or when did you last privatise anything in the United States? They just don't do it. And anyone who's gone through an American airport has a legitimate gripe <laughs> about the quality yeah, of the terrible. airport, right? Yeah, they're they're terrible, terrible, right? On average, they're terrible. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, it comes to a head. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to be, you know, scaring people, but it, 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 it will come to a head in one form or another. And, and, and the question is how, how people respond at that time. And there's been many responses over years to rampant inflation. Um, many lessons in history. Let me give you the alternative view, which is perhaps even more pessimistic. Uh, and oh, good. <laughs> um, uh, th this was shared with me by my opposite number at the Institute Bruno Leone in Italy, uh, Alberto Mingardi. He reached, and Italy's obviously had a terrible time of it. I mean, you know, essentially no net growth for. 25 years. But I mean, the Europeans UK's... have their debt coming down. Yeah, that's true. Unlike that's true. the UK, Australia yeah. and the US, right? This was yeah. more about the total size of government than, the, sure, than sure. the scale of the debt. And Alberto had reached the um, uncomfortable conclusion. Uh, I can't remember it was, who it was it said that democracy doesn't get you the best government, it doesn't even necessarily get you a good government, but it does get you the government you deserve, right? <laughs> and in his view, actually, the size of government was set by what we can afford. Now, debt is obviously on top of that, but yeah. we've already agreed there's a, there, there is some sort of limit to how much you can buy. But as we get richer, governments will do more, right? I mean, so all of these entitlement schemes and, um, you know, the National Health Service, when it was initially brought in, uh, was, you know, did very little for you. Now, as technology has improved and we can, you know, potentially help people recover from cancer, and we can afford to do that because the country is enormously richer than it was in 1948. That the size of the government you get, not just on its spending, but on what it regulates, sure, the number of quangos sure. and all of the rest of it. If we get much richer over the next hundred years, government will also get much bigger, won't it? Because it's just a fact. One is just a factor of the other. Well, for sure. <clears throat> I mean, there's no philosophical base to a lot of political leaders these days. It's just populism. Mm -hmm. Which is heart wrenching. Yeah. And and look, you know, COVID. Wow. I mean, you know, I say to business, uh, government's always been there over here on the collecting some of your revenue for its coffers, and then government got more involved in the regulation of your business, and we've seen that over the years in telecommunications mm -hmm. or healthcare or education or, you know, even retail with regulated hours and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But for the first time ever, under COVID, the government was on the income side of your business. Mm -hmm. They were providing income to your businesses and income to your households. And in some cases, it was slow to go. In other cases, there's an expectation now that if there is a significant downturn or another pandemic, the government is going to provide income. Now, from where? Mm -hmm. From mm -hmm. where? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what about a, another constraint we might come up against? And this is very different in different jurisdictions. I'd be interested to know where you think it might sit in Australia. You compared the, the, the GDP debt levels in Australia, the US and the UK. Uh, but I can speak to the UK example and indeed some comparisons with our European neighbours. There appears to be, I'm not saying it's an iron law, but there appears to be a maximum proportion of GDP that the state can extract from the private sector in the UK. If you were to look over my lifetime or, or, a, bit long, or, or, or a bit longer, I'm in my early 50s, 38-39% um, of GDP seems to be the most the government can extract from the economy. And I'm looking at this over 50-60 years in which we've had a multitude of different governments, sure. red and sure. blue, sure. coalition, big majorities, small majorities. Yeah. We sometimes have governments which aren't looking to tax to the max, the, yeah. the, the Thatcher government. You mentioned the Clinton government, which was uh, very much um, uh, you know, towards the low tax, low spend end of it, despite being Democrats. But we've tried every tax mix you can. Uh, VAT rates of anywhere between 5 and 20%. You referenced, Joe, 
98% tax on, on, on earned savings income. We've had the top rate of tax at 40%. It's now 45. It was previously 83 on income. We've tried every mix of tax. And the most you can extract in the UK economy seems to be towards the high 30s. If yeah. you're absolutely yeah. determined to bleed dry every penny you can. Not that I'm suggesting that should be uh, the policy. But on a Laffer curve basis, 38, 39% of GDP seems to be about the, mu uh, the most the British government can extract. It's different in other jurisdictions. In Denmark, for example, closer to 50%. And you might ask why. My guess is that they have a, uh, a less mobile population, probably. Right? Well, that's um, part of it, yeah. That's part um, of it, yeah. But if there is a maximum amount of tax that you can extract in each jurisdiction, sooner or later, that sets the maximum level of government spend, right? I mean, obviously, you can borrow in year one and take on that debt in year two. But in very rough and simple terms, and, you know, offsetting things like sale of assets or whatever else, if the UK government can only bring in 38% of GDP at a maximum, that sets the ceiling for government spend, doesn't it? I don't, I don't agree. I mean, there, there are the other factors... That come into play are, um, you know, this is why we've all got to defend free and open trade, because that is a handbrake on government actions. Mm -hmm. Free and open trade. I mean, I had an enormous fight with President Trump about tariffs, uh, and Australia was the only country in the world excluded from tariffs. It took a lot of effort, but um, the US receding back into a tariff-based economy, a protectionist economy, is disastrous for the US and the world. And Joe Biden didn't change any of those Trump initiatives at all. Um, and protectionism has become a, a, a... You know, it's toxic for freedom. It's toxic for com competition. It ends up being a... Um, tariffs and quotas end up being highly inflationary and have a terrible impact on, on economies. And what's held that premise together that you talked about is the fact that the UK wanted to be open. It is... I still view London as the world's uh, number one business city, more than New York, and I go there a lot. So... Uh, and why? Because it is truly global. London is a global city. New York is very... Uh, you know, even though it's the biggest capital markets in the world, it is very much dominated by the United States. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so you, you can see countries regress rapidly. I mean, look at Venezuela. I mean, they can regress rapidly because of authoritarianism. I mean, Turkey was on the cusp of that under Erdogan originally. Various countries can go that way. Um, at various times, France has gone, you know, that way and then has some sort of minor correction. So I, I, I'm not sure that, you know, there is a limit to what governments can do. What I am sure is that the best way to stop it to have free, of, uh, free and open markets and mobility of capital. So business walks, people walk when it gets too expensive. Yeah, uh, but you, you'd agree, wouldn't you, that uh, a tariff is just another tax on your oh, own God, population? Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> I mean, it's the crazy. idea you impose a tariff and it's, you know, on, I, don't, I don't know, on BMWs and this is somehow paid by some major corporation in Germany. No, it would just be a tax <laughs> on a Brit who wants to buy a BMW and drive it here. I, I, was explaining tax, that, right? I was explaining that to the President of the United States. Yeah, he didn't get that. <laughs> right, 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 right. OK. I um, gave him my best shot. OK. Did you make any progress? Because he might be President again before you know it. Yeah. Uh. Um, <laughs> But, but that's still just a tax. I mean, and you're, people will find ways around it, right? I mean, again, I mentioned Denmark earlier, which seems to be able to tax its population at a, a higher rate. But it's a, it's a closed economy, Dim. Effectively, yeah, no yeah. immigration. Yeah. You know, and and you know, it's it's. I mean, not many people say I'm going to invest in Denmark. No, that's true. And I can't remember what their tax is on motor cars. When I was last in Copenhagen, I asked my host, you know. Why are so many of you riding around in bicycles? I mean, are you not aware of the invention of the motor car? But the tax on buying a new car was, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was, it was extraordinary. Yeah. It, was something, it was 100% or something yeah, like yeah. that. It wasn't... And well, it, you it, remember when the French imposed a wealth tax? Yeah, yeah. And all, you know, basically you could see the cars lined up going into Belgium. Yeah, uh, and, and to London. That's true. And, and well, London. probably London yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. We need to accept them. So mobility should, should, should actually... Given we're becoming more and more mobile, it's much more conceivable now that I, I don't know, that, that I would move to a different country for work. It would be relatively simple. 
My father did. He worked in America for a while. For my grandparents, sure. inconceivable. So if that mobility increases, where we can hot foot it to you know, more attractive jurisdictions, the maximum tax collection starts to fall. Right? Yeah. I mean, we're having True. that debate here at the Correct. moment. I, there was some report today, uh, it was an EU observatory, I think, on a wealth tax, as if we could just claim this from billionaires in the United Kingdom, and they wouldn't react at all. You yeah. know, they would just yeah, sit there and pay it, rather than saying, actually, that's the last trigger I need to move to Sydney or Singapore or, or wherever else. So is the amount that government's going to be able to collect in tax going to fall? because of increased mobility and us being able to relocate well, all over the world. Yeah, well, you'd hope so. I, I'm not sure it will, though. I mean, they're, you know, the US is, in, in, from a tax perspective, a pretty closed economy. Plus, they tax on the worldwide income. Right. <sighs> brutal. That is brutal. And that was a Trump initiative. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so Which, again, feeds protectionism. Yeah, yeah. So you don't think it's going to be easier and easier to no. escape? I mean, I, I would have thought now it's easier for certainly a British company to relocate than it would have been 40 or so years ago. I mean, AstraZeneca decided to site their plant in the Republic of Ireland rather than the UK. This is, you know, given as a standout example of why our corporation tax should be lower. Yeah. Those decisions do seem to me to be more mobile now than they would have been in the 1980s. Sure, right? sure, absolutely. Um, the trend, you mentioned uh, you don't want to drink from the fountain of youth, um, <laughs> uh, but what are we, the trend seems to be against us as well in terms of demographics. If we are all going to live to the age of 560 and, and expect a state pension for the last half millennium of our life, this is somewhat problematic in terms of... Uh, well, of unless you're healthy and you just keep going, right? right. And I think people in the main want to keep working. But they're going to have many different careers. I mean, you know, you speak to tradies, builders, electricians, plumbers. It's a point where, you know, you don't want to climb under a house to change a pipe. Yeah. And you can totally understand it. You know, you know bricklayers. I, I started my career doing as a builder's labourer. and I mean, it's bloody hard work, right? So you've got to have the capacity to have multiple careers. And... Um, Look, we'll feel younger, you know, um, medicine's just remarkable in what it can do now and, and it's going to get better. Um, you know, uh, privately, the people around David Sinclair will tell you that, uh, that um, you know, they're firmly of the belief that uh, Generation X will have the option to live for an extra two or three hundred years, which is mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. um, and... It, you know, but, but what, competently what, so, not yeah, in the yeah, care sure. home oh, for no, 200 years. No, 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 no. I mean, you know, they're, they're, it's yeah. they're, they're sort of, you know, they say, imagine what, you know, what the world would be like if Einstein was still alive, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, and you, you, it's sort of take, you know, it's it's surreal almost mm -hmm. the debate. But if whatever research they're doing at Harvard, I'm prepared to bet that somewhere in China, someone's doing Something much similar. more much more advanced research without any guide rails. Okay. So, you know, there's that, that, that's, and what is, you know, the biggest demographic bubble in the history of humanity is China. I mean, that's, that's a whole game changer. Mm -hmm. um, and Japan is living with it, going from a population of 120 million to 80 million over time. So, you know, they're using robotics. They've developed robotics that in nursing homes, a robot turns people over who are bedridden. I mean, it, you know, replacing nurses. And this is, this is very real. So um, I don't want to think too much about that, really. But, uh, but it's I going mean, to be epic. Whatever it, it will be. Of course it will be epic. Yeah. We know the future is going to be epic. We know that. I've got one more question, then I'm going to come to the floor. So catch my eye as I think several people who want to come in. I think there's a microphone. That, yeah, we've got a microphone at the back. My, my last question is about the way to try and solve the dilemma you so brilliantly laid out. And I'm asking myself the question, is it to try and persuade politicians not to go for short-term popularity, to make the unpopular decisions, to sometimes do a budget which might be successful but was reflected upon as being a difficult decision at the time, trying to encourage politicians to think long-term and the rest of it. And I suppose just having a kind of self-denying ordinance in our, in our political classes, just hoping that we can get that message through. 
Or is there a kind of different way to crack this nut? I mean, I'm wondering on entitlement programs, for example, where we can put forward arguments that they can't be as generous, they should be more means tested. I think it's extraordinary at the moment the number of people in Britain who qualify for some form of welfare. Yeah. I, I'm about the only demographic that doesn't. I'm in my <laughs> early 50s, have no kids, I'm in a job, don't require any housing benefit. But, you know, if I had kids, I'd qualify for welfare, sure. despite my, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, relatively high earnings. So do we do this through a kind of process of iteration and encouraging politicians to think for the longer term? And, you know, who will think of the generation after next we're passing on the debt? Or can we find a workaround? I mean, one thought I had, I haven't developed this in any uh, particularly sort of serious or algorithmic way, is should we offer people opt-outs from entitlement programmes? So for sake of <laughs> argument, uh, I, I would be willing for a kickback on my taxes, to be clear, for a kickback on my taxes, to undertake never to use NHS services, yeah. not to claim the state pension, uh, if I were to have any children, not to send them to state schools, et cetera, et cetera. And if I opt out of this list of goodies, then I would expect some kickback on my tax, right? That maybe I don't pay national insurance contributions anymore. I'm not expecting to get my tax to zero. But I wonder whether you could offer people, going to your NHS point about it being the kind of, I think it was the late, great Nigel Lawson who described it as England's national religion being the national yeah. service. Uh -huh. But why don't we just put a market test here? If you're willing to opt out of the NHS, I mean, you might still need accident and emergency services, but I mean, on, on, on all other treatment, you're going to pay as you go, tick this box on your tax reform, and you'll get this amount of money back. Well, uh, you know, it's a good question. Um, uh, in uh, Australia, you can opt out exactly what you just talked mm -hmm. about, effectively, uh, but you're financially penalised if you do. Um, so you can take out private... If you don't take out private health insurance, your tax goes up. Right. And you take out private health insurance, you have a choice of whether you go to the private system or the public system. Um, but accident and emergency, you, as you say, you go to the, the public system. Um, <clears throat> in the United States, where I also... I, you know, I paid uh, 25... If I was on a life-for-life -life basis, I'd be paying... Uh, 25,000 US dollars for a family health plan, private health insurance, in Australia I pay 3,000. So it's built, you know, it's, it, it, it's very difficult to compare. Um, you've got to, I think you've got to have a hybrid system. The solution is some means testing and some co-payments. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's as simple as that. We all want the people most vulnerable to get whatever cover they need. And that's been a failure in the US system as well, by the way. But the UK, I think, is, is, is too blindsided by its love for the NHS. Mm -hmm. I remember watching the opening of the Olympics and there was James Bond in hospital beds, yeah. you know, being pushed around. I was sort of like, what the... What the hell? It was like... Uh, that was kind of surprising to me at that time. But, um, uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know how you do it unless it, someone has the courage to take lead. A lot of... A number of politicians have started to pick up that the most valuable commodity in politics in the 21st century is authenticity. Yes. You've got to be authentic. And that and does seem to be proven in a range of... Well, it is. Results. It's coming yeah. through. Yeah. And it's taken so long uh, for political leaders to work it out. Um, but still some believe that it's better to be, uh, you know, responding to populism. You see it every day on CNN or MSNBC or Fox, politicians responding to the populist cause rather than doing what it is authentically... What you see is what you get. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And so um, it's quite interesting. In the US, a lot of governors are very authentic. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has hurt Ron DeSantis. Mm -hmm. He looks very authentic as the governor of Florida and people really like what he does and he says what he thinks and so on. But then he's come across on a national level as looking like... He's not authentic. He's just out of political casting. So yeah, that's right. Casting, and that's, yeah. re that's blown him out of the water. So, you know, and then others are, are, are starting to come through, like Nikki Haley, who looks more authentic. Or Jay back Ramishwami. Well, that's right. Well, 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 I'm not so big on him. but the, the, He's authentic, though, is he? Well, yeah. I, don't, I don't know about that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry to uh, But, you know, Joe Biden's authentic. Mm. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, Joe Biden, people know him. He is authentic. He's the real deal. Bill Clinton was yeah, right. authentic as well. So, you know, like, it's... it's, it's and this is what got Trump elected and yeah, could yeah. get him elected again. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's why people call him Teflon. He's not Teflon. It's just they know who he is. Yeah, yeah. And they know what he's saying and, you know, he's predictable. Just on your... I, 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 just before I come to the floor and if we can bring the microphone up towards the front, I've got three or four questions at the front. On, on your point about the London Olympics opening ceremony... Yes. Uh, uh, you're right. It was James Bond... Uh, hospital beds. Oh, and the Industrial Revolution was terrible. I think that was the other, <laughs> that was the other thing, wasn't it? But the it was apparently the best Olympics, though. Well done. Uh, well, it may have been the best <laughs> Olympics, but if you can still find the, there was a French TV station, and uh, I, 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 I don't speak or understand f f French fluently. If you can still find it on YouTube, it was great because their coverage of the opening ceremony after James Bond with the Queen and the rest of it, when the NHS bit started, the commentator says. And this just shows the self-deprecating dry wit of the English, because they are <laughs> celebrating here the worst healthcare system in the Western world as part of their um, as part of their opening ceremony. Uh, let me bring the question to. Uh, I'm going to take the two gentlemen on the front, then James just behind you. If you could introduce yourself, um, I'll take those three and then come back to you, Joe. If you could introduce yourself, yeah, and thank keep you. Your question. Sure, it can be a speech, but only a sentence long and it must end in a question mark. OK, thank you. Chris Daniel. Um, yeah, entitlement is really underlying social justice. That, that was started by Robin Hood and perpetuated by the Labour Party now. Uh, we, we, we're taxed, yes, but we're getting money taken off us or businesses are getting money taken off us by something that we're not really focusing on, and that's debt. Um, it, the government are, are really, cap, you know, Cap in hand, really, with debt they, they're gaining because every pound they're spent they're getting tax off. There's no incentive for government to stop debt. And in fact, they've brought in things like in, you know, bankruptcy and debt respite orders, next year statutory debt repayment plans. And so it's not just taxation that the burden is being shared on the public by. It, actually, debt that, that the population is building up because they think they're entitled to things and they'll go into debt because they can. And the government don't want to stop that because they're getting taxed every time they spend over and what they can't afford and won't end up paying back. So, you know, why has why that, do you think, gone so unnoticed that businesses and the upper earners, if you like, are paying oh. twice, once through taxation and once through debt? Great. Gentlemen, to you. Right. Um, I want to focus on the Again, word... if you could introduce yourself. Uh, sorry, Matthew Kavanagh. Um, uh, I want to focus on the word age in, in the sentence because actually a recurrent theme of a lot of what you've been saying tonight is about people living longer. Um, and, and the assumption is with this whole debate is it's a spend uh, less and, and, and earn more. But age is another paradigm. It's sort of the third dimension in this, people working longer. And in this country, we have a problem with a lot of older people opting out of active work and I wonder whether you've had any thoughts about which countries are getting the age equation right because this applies to China it applies I, I've just come back from eight years in Qatar for the sovereign wealth on there I mean they have a, a, a demographic time bomb as does the whole Middle East as does Europe as does North America as does Australia who's who's addressing it who's getting this age question right and what do you think might be some of the policies and some of the going back to your comments about authenticity and honesty for politicians might what might be some of the things they need to be saying about age and the working life that we all have to endure that would be honest about helping maybe the age factor of the age of entitlement become a bit truer? I think just behind you. Uh, J James Bartholomew. Um, I don't want to get it to be missed, the point that you two were almost making. Um, when Mark talks about opt-outs, that is a disastrous way to go politically because it sounds like a favour to the rich. Whereas the Australian way, where you've gone with healthcare, is quite the opposite and frames it the opposite way around. You are penalised if you do not pay for your own healthcare. And so you should penalise people for not paying for the healthcare. You shouldn't give them a, the pleasure of an opt-out. It's exactly the same thing in the end, but it, it's, it's a much better way of framing it. And that's why it's worked in Australia. One of the reasons it's worked in Australia. But the main point I wanted to make is this. Uh, in the 1970s, which I uh, unfortunately remember, um, the uh, debt went up very, very high. Taxes went up, as you pointed out, very, very high. And this was, and a crisis came, a big crisis came and was recognised as a crisis. Britain was called the sick man of Europe and so on and so forth. And then 
finally, we reach such a crisis, as you've described crises coming, that finally uh, Thatcher was elected and we started tackling it. Now we seem to be going through the same thing all over again. It seems like a generation passes, everyone forgets that debt is a problem, that inflation is a problem, that welfare benefits, uh, entitlement going crazy is a problem. Mm. And so that was dealt with in the eventually, slowly, in the 80s, 90s, thousands. You know, Ian Duncan Smith you know, revived, uh, re re reformed welfare. These things happened over, over the next 20 or 30 years, mm. and we got, got reformed. But now we're going down. Every, the next generation of voters has completely forgotten about that, doesn't have any clue about it, mm. and we go round in a circle. And this sounds like, seems like an endless circle where we bump up against the ceiling of doing all these things to excess, and then finally we say, oh, my God, we better do something about it, and we go round again. This mm. seems like an eternal circle. So, Joe, they just remind you of the questions Daniel asked about, uh, I guess, kind of private debt as well, but mm. not just government debt, which is in the interest of government. You know, borrow money, go out and spend things, and we'll claim the VAT on it. And the fact that you've got a big bill is, is a problem. Matthew asked on the on the ageing population, is there a role model somewhere in the world that have begun, yeah. begun to do it? And then James said, you know, are we destined to repeat ourselves. You'll be back here for Back to the Future parts three, four. It'd be Mission Impossible part eight before yes. you know it, right? Uh, or or yeah. is there some way of actually permanently resetting? So two thirds of economic growth comes from household consumption. So when you see, uh, you know, the you know, economic growth figures, two thirds of it comes from the increase in household consumption. So governments want them, if they haven't got their own money, they want them to have debt. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, Australia is a net importer of capital uh, and a number of countries are. And, uh, you know, when, when I borrow for my mortgage in Australia, um, about a third of the money is coming from overseas in that mortgage that's being lent to me because we don't have enough domestic savings. Same in the US, but I think pretty much same here as well. Uh, whereas in other jurisdictions, Japan has massive government debt but it has a massive amount of domestic savings. The old adage about uh, Japanese housewives so doing the saving in the household. Um, so that's, that's one reason why, you know, you, you have debt. The other reason is it's, it, debt can be a good thing to, on business to help to have another set of eyes on the performance of the business. So um, I've been dealing with uh, a number of founder-based businesses of five, six hundred million dollars. And they've never had, they've never had any other set of eyes. They're, you know, debt free, or they borrow a bit of money from the bank. It's actually really helpful from a corporate governance's perspective to have another a bank or someone casting their eyes on the accounts and on processes to have better corporate governance. But having too much debt, like everything, is going to be painful. Uh, in relation to age, I don't know what country does it well. Um, of course, there's no safety net in China, so so much relies and still. Even though they abolished the one-child policy, uh, so much relies on that one child uh, to uh, pay for the family. Uh, and they've got a massive demographic bubble. Uh, Japan's no different. Um, I really couldn't identify a country that gets it right. Is it's it just the demographics? I mean, I, I'm going to get the numbers wrong here, but it's something extraordinary like Saudi Arabia, half the population are under the age of 30 or something. Oh, yeah, well, the uh, whole of Africa is the same. Yeah. I mean... Africa's incredible story of growth, but 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 you know how do we how do we age with dignity and and give people options? Well, what um, should the retirement age be? In most well, I think the retirement age needs to be proportional to the to the to the um, um, longevity, and I tried to do that in my budget, I like failed. <laughs> but to his credit, Emmanuel Macron just increased. The retirement age in France, they took that very well in France, I thought. <laughs> um, and, uh, they're such a tolerant, embracing nation. It's like, you know, very embracing. It's the only time I, uh, I, I cheered for another rugby team other than France. <laughs> the, the, but um, uh, so, yeah, I, look, I, you know, and that was after they lowered it previously, uh, about a decade ago. So they lowered it, now they're increasing it well. But, you know, hit over the back of the head with a cricket bat for reality. Um, and then the last question on, on, uh, on welfare. Cycle. Yeah, we're just going to continually make the same mistakes and 
then have to mop them up every 50 years. We'll, we'll live beyond our means, and then somebody has to clean it all up, and we're, we're yeah. never really learning. Yeah, true. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> Is there any way out of that kind of doom loop, do you think? Do you think you could have some fundamental reset that, you know, or are we, you know, in 2073, are we going to have the same argument again and that things are... About entitlements? Yeah, or? about entitlements or some other element of government spending. But it's just bound to get out of control until there's a corrective mechanism. Of you know, what it really impresses me about the US is it's... Um, is... You, you, know, you know, they're huge countries. The US, Russia, China, they're massive countries born out of revolutions, modern countries. And then after the revolution, they had civil wars. All three of them had terrible civil wars. And what happened was, in China and Russia, in order to maintain control, Moscow or Beijing needs to rule with an iron fist. Mm -hmm. um, in the United States, it's the Constitution and the Bill of Rights that give people the comfort that wherever they live in the United States, they're bigger than the government. And it can be really ugly, as we saw on January 6 uh, previously, but by God it works because the nation, you know, when I heard General Milley the other day say, my job is to defend the Constitution, not an individual, not to protect... He was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. That was a heroic statement. Uh, and he sees it as his God-given duty as the head of the military to protect something that gives people freedom. And, you know, that's, that's really valuable. I mean, you know, the UK has all that the monarchy represents, which is very powerful. But not many countries had the opportunity to grab onto something to defend their freedoms. And, and, and you know, so that check and balance is really rare and it's, and it's getting harder and harder to find in various demographics. And that'll be... I think that'll be the handbrake for a number of different countries. Yeah. I'm going to come back to the floor, but just on the ageing point, I'll get some of the numbers wrong here, but, so don't quote me, don't assume my exact numbers are correct, but the, the, the rough uh, lay of the land is correct. The, the UK was the first country to bring in a state pension for men, and when the Liberal government did that just over 100 years ago, I think it kicked in at, say, 65. Uh, life expectancy for men was 58. Correct, yeah. And if you made it to 65, yeah. your life expectancy was only to make it to 67. <laughs> so you're actually, you're actually yeah, that's even right. if you made it there, Correct. unusually, yeah, yeah. you were probably yeah. only going to have two years on the yeah, state yeah. pension anyway. You're yeah. absolutely right. We followed. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's an extraordinary change in yeah, entitlement yeah, know, on yeah, the pensions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me come back to the floor. I'll go on this side. So let me take the lady at the front, then I'll take uh, Keith on the aisle, and then Felix just behind. Again, if you could introduce yourself, that would be fantastic. Thank you. G'day, Joe. Latika Burke, Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, two questions. One, what about business entitlement? If a business profited from government support during COVID, should they hand back the money that they actually got to try and keep them afloat during that period? And if they don't voluntarily give it back, should they actually be required to give it back, forced to give it back? And my second question is, I actually went back and reread your original speech. Oh, good you referenced being the son of a Palestinian uh, refugee in that. Um, and I'm just wondering for your observations on the prospects of a two-state solution given the recent events. Wow. Then behind you, let, let's, go, let's go directly behind you and then, then I'll go to Keith on the aisle. I thought I was safe here talking about <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, Sorry, Felix. Uh, I, I, sorry, my name's Felix. I am a civil servant. Um, I was going to ask, uh, what, what, what's, the, what's the killer argument that we have to make? How do you convince people to accept less entitlement now in return for more in the future, especially... The, the argument normally is about people's children. It seems fewer and fewer people are having are having children. Yeah. Are we are is there is there a realistic prospect of us of, of people making that choice? It's a great question. Uh, and then on the aisle, Keith. Again, if you could introduce yourself, Keith. So my name is Keith Boyfield. I'm a regulation fellow at the IEA. My question is, how far is the media to blame? in terms of they're always extolling the virtues of public expenditure and the money, you know, the money should come from the government. And it's very interesting that this month in Australia you had a vote 
on setting up a bureaucracy for a group that was deemed to be, by the media, very disadvantaged, your native Aboriginal population. And I noticed that not one single state in Australia voted to set up this bureaucracy. And the howls of the media, not just in Australia, but worldwide, about how a terrible, terrible mm -hmm. policy decision was being taken by the electorate. But I think it just reflects the fact that the media are so out of touch with the people. So three people and four questions. Letitia, is it? And Letitia. And Letitia in the front row. Corporate welfare, not yeah. just you know corporate entitlement. Uh, large numbers of companies were bailed out during COVID. I don't know what the Australian scheme was. Here we had the furlough scheme, so you could basically uh, stop your employees working and 80% of their salary will be paid by the government up to a certain limit. Uh, one boss said to me, one company owner said to me, wow, these tax pipes... Who knew that the water could flow the other way? <laughs> right. um, but I mean, it was a huge bailout to, to, to companies. And then also uh, asked about uh, the very easy question. I'm sure you can bat it away in seconds, how to resolve the Middle East crisis. Um, Phoenix, yeah. after that, what's the killer argument on the, on the generational stuff? I've often wondered about this as well. Why is it that these arguments about debt and what we're piling on to the next generation in terms of what they'll have to pay for what we're getting, don't seem to have traction. But arguments about, say, climate change do. Mm. So the, <coughs> the environment that we'll leave to our children or grandchildren, even if we don't actually have children or grandchildren, seems to have traction. But the debt that we're passing on doesn't. And then Keith asked you the easiest question ever. Ask a former politician, <laughs> is the media to blame? Right? Talk, about, <laughs> talk about an underarm, right? <laughs> Well, in deference to Latika and any <laughs> other media, no, the, the media is not to blame. I mean, they've, they're driven by whatever they're driven by. That you know, I still, even though I've been subject to all sorts of commentary by individuals in the media, I will be the first to defend freedom of the press, and we should, we should, we should, you know, we should do everything we can to protect freedom of the press, uh, and. Um, I think increasingly people are choosing what media they listen to. Uh, having said that, when, I, when I'm in Washington, which is half the year, um, you know, cable TV has CNN, MSNBC, Fox. I can't watch any of them. <laughs> and uh, I watch Russian television, right. which comes through all the satellite. And one of my friends said, you know, you've gone up the CIA watch list. <laughs> <laughs> But your view is that's less biased. Well, at least I know American where it's coming from. Right, right, well, right. I know where everything's yeah, coming yeah. from. But, it, you know, Al Jazeera, they, they give you a different perspective. So you've really got to shop around to get, to get some intellectual nourishment. Um, so that's, that's challenging, I think, and it shouldn't be that hard. Uh, Latika, the, it, it's a great question about business getting payments um, and should they repay it back. Look, at the end of the day, a tax on business is a tax on shareholders and employees. And, uh, you know, the question really should be about whether they made a profit or loss. Some businesses made really big profits during COVID, like Amazon or Harvey Norman and a few people like that. You know, it just worked to their advantage. But then again, would you tax AstraZeneca or, or Pfizer? AstraZeneca didn't make that much money. I'm, I'm but, only talking about the companies that... You're, you're trying to say... Qantas, really. Yeah. You're getting into Qantas. <laughs> we know what you're saying. I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, no, it's, I know what you're saying, asking about. So you took, you took the shilling from the state. You've made a huge profit. Yeah, that's right. Isn't it time to pay that back? Yeah, well, there's a reasonable argument about that. And in the U US, they have a loan system for business, but then they forgive the loans, mm -hmm. right? That's a different way of doing it. Uh, I don't think there is an easy solution. And you, whenever you give universal entitlements, there will be people that get it, or businesses that get it that shouldn't deserve it. I really, I would have had a different scheme in Australia, um, but small businesses, you know, you're running a delicatessen or something, you've got three employees, family business, what are you going to do? People can't come in the shop. You know, do you fall over? Do you lose everything? Uh, it's a really tough, tough issue. Uh, much easier to solve the Middle East. Um, <laughs> and uh, I say rather ironically, um, yeah, I'm, I'm proudly the son of a Palestinian refugee to Australia. Um, 
have always been torn about the Middle East without any solution. I want Israel to survive and in peace. Um, I want the Palestinian people to have hope. Uh, and in the middle sits, you know, horrific terrorist organisations that have an absolute disregard for human life. Um, and uh, I can't help but think at the moment that the Israelis are holding back on invading Gaza because the risk is that as soon as they go into the south, an invading army, as we've seen in Ukraine, needs to be much larger than, uh, you know, a defending army. Um, but uh, if they move into Gaza, there'll be a massive amount of innocent casualties, which will in turn fire up Hezbollah in the north, which is sitting on 200,000 rockets uh, and has much more firepower than Hamas. And then you've got the West Bank, which could easily ignite as well. And uh, I think that's probably why the US has moved a second carrier group to the Middle East, um, because, you know, it is, it is the risk... As people of Britain know, 1914 is very real and it's, it's on the cusp. Now, how you pull back is, is a very, very challenging issue. I know the Saudis and the Qataris have been much more measured than they would have previously been. The Egyptians and the Jordanians are playing a crucial role. I think everyone's just fearful of where it's heading and trying to work out how to, how to, how to address it. It's very, very difficult. I think there's a lot of diplomacy going on behind the scenes, thank God. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, if people don't have hope, they'll take drastic actions. You've got to give everyone hope that tomorrow will be better than today. Otherwise, the personal sacrifice of their life is, is, is not that much. Can I just come um, back on the, the corporate welfare issue? Because this exercised me as well. Why should you know, companies that are making profits have received the support of the state. But is it actually different to the individual welfare issue? I mean, suppose somebody 20 years ago here was on unemployment benefit or job seekers allowance, and yeah. they've now gone on to be a millionaire. Yeah. I mean, should they pay back the benefits that they got as a teenager or, 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 or not? We have these issues about sort of student loans and, you know, you go through university and how should it be... Surely we just get the tax system to do that heavy lifting. Then. Yeah, well, the, the tax system does. But, I mean, look, you know, different countries had different systems on COVID. In the US, businesses, because it's such a flexible labour market, businesses laid off a lot of people. So you saw that massive spike in unemployment, which in turn has a dramatic impact on consumer confidence, on every confidence, right? So there was a disconnect between employer and employees because they were, they were sacked. And... Once you break that link, it's very hard to get it back. In Australia, they designed a system where the money would go to the employer to keep the employees. Right. So the employer would only get the money if they retained on their employment role those employees. So that nexus was never broken, yeah, yeah. which meant that the recovery was much economically faster. Yeah. So it varies. The, the scheme's varied. I mean, look, you know, I'm very close to, to people in Fiji and, and Fiji generally. And, you know, what happened to all those hotels in Fiji? People went back to their villages and they went back to subsistence lifestyle. Mm -hmm. They didn't get any... No one... There was no money in Fiji to give people. All they wanted was the vaccine and the tourists back. So yep. it just varied dramatically from place to place. That was a great question about, you know... And I'm mindful, uh, you know, there are... When I talk about, you know, future generations, I'm mindful that there are a lot of people in our community that... That, that, that don't have kids, that's fine. I mean, and, and you know, time to time with teenagers, I perfectly understand why. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, you're right about climate change. I mean, you know, people in the world want to leave a better world. And I don't think we, you know, only by... I'm not saying a speech like this, but I'd love to hear... You know, the last time I gave a speech... I remember a number of MPs in the room took it to David Cameron and he, he actually stole the line under the age of entitlement mm -hmm. at a speech at a Tory conference, right, and talked a bit about it. Uh, I think George Osborne tried to do parts of it at times. You know, I've spoken to George a fair bit about it, but, you know, it just comes down to conviction. 
And you've got to have some core beliefs in this life, haven't you? I mean, living within your means, is that such a bad belief? You know, it's pretty tough. Well, we badge it wrong. We, 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 we call living within your means austerity. Well, that, yeah, so, you know, and, and the vernacular, living the within vernacular your means. is so, you know, it's so powerful, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, you know, I, I had to, as treasurer, I laid off, I had to lay off in my budget 15,000 public servants, civil servants. That was bloody hard. You know, you, get, you read the letters from them, their families. It was really, really hard, you know. And um, But at the end of the day, it had no material impact on the delivery of services. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and where it did, we would go and step in and, and pull in more people. I mean, and I'll, I'll just give you one further bit of comfort. I've discovered the private sector is far more bureaucratic than the public sector. <laughs> Let me tell you, big business is terrible. Really, really inefficient. And We're the bureaucracy in big business, I mean, I never knew that. But now We're I up against the clock, but I'm okay. going to try and get a couple more in. There's a gentleman at the back, and then I'll take a gentleman on the aisle here, and then the guy at the front. Three, if you're going to be very quick there, please. Th thank you. Uh, Michael Loveridge, you, you just spoke about big business, and if we look at the last century, the most notable thing, apart from the reduction of the uh, size of the world, uh, is the growth of corporatism in government and, and in big business. That is about to see an absolutely huge leap forward with the advent of AI, uh, which for the first time ever, innovation will replace middle class jobs yeah. on a huge scale. How do you see that playing out for yeah, the future? Question. Uh, then on the aisle here again, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you, um, Jack Piggott. One of your predecessors, Peter Costello, uh, implemented a report, the Intergenerational Report, uh, which is an, an annual statement about the burden on future generations. How important do you think it is that we at least measure the impact on future generations and do you see that as part of the solution, perhaps, for other states? Yeah, great, yeah. great question. Yeah. And then right at the front. Cheers. Hans Van Leeuwen from the Australian Financial Review. Thanks for a really interesting speech. Just a very quick one. Can I just clarify something you were saying during the conversation? Do you think there is a reasonable probability that the US will default at some point? OK, there you go. <laughs> I, I wanted you to have three easy questions at the end, Joe. What can I say? So, uh, AI. There is a really interesting thing here. We've, we've done some of uh, the IEA. I mean, generally, we're in favour of technology and it might displace jobs, but, uh, you know, in the same way that there are fewer blacksmiths now in the United Kingdom thanks to the invention of the motor car, nevertheless, the United Kingdom gets bigger. But really interesting point is coming for the white-collar jobs, right? I mean, this is not sure. manufacturing. This mm. is uh, potentially lawyers and accountants. Lawyers. Are going to be, yeah, yeah. lawyers are yeah. going to be out of business. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm warming to it even more at, the, uh, at that <laughs> suggestion. Jack asked about um, intergenerational, you know, should it be measured in some way? Should it be in the budget handbook? This is mm. the amount of money we're handing over to everybody under the age of 16 or whatever. And then the, the last question was on uh, US default. I mean, I, I was pushing that quite a lot. And I mean, but, uh, you know, do you think defaults coming to the West, uh, perhaps the United States, uh, mm. or, or will we swerve away from that and correct course beforehand? Mm. So on AI, um, in my lifetime, I have never seen uh, uh, innovators come to regulators and say, you have to regulate us because we are fearful of what we're about to do. And that's applied in AI. I mean, it's extraordinary in Washington. It's just done to hit in the rest of the world. But I mean, in Washington, they're saying, please, we know what we're about to do. We know what AI can do. You've got to regulate us. You've got to set some guardrails. Um, and why? Because w when you speak to some of those innovators in the Valley or, or you know, wherever they are, Austin, Texas or wherever, they, they, they're just, their eyes roll into the back of their heads about the possibility of what AI can do and, it, and the speed of its rollout uh, and whether it, 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 you know, has a real capacity to replace human beings um, and, and at a rapid rate. I mean, this is not a sort of replacement of the, um, you know, of uh, a, a, 
I mean, it, 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 it's not a... You mentioned about, uh, you know, the, uh, how bad the Industrial Revolution was. I mean, this is, this is, this is at warp speed how quickly it's going to come and how it's going to change our lives. I mean, even... But potentially beneficial. Oh, I mean, there, there are, of course there are going to be beneficial aspects huge. to it, but it's also uh, when it's unfettered. I mean, for example, you know, uh, Congress is now... Look, legislatures usually respond to challenges. They don't try and anticipate challenges, and that's not a bad thing. But in this case, uh, for example, uh, AI proponents have come along and said... You've got, to, you've got to force us to disclose on the telephone call that it's not Joe Hockey on the phone, that it's in fact his voice. Mm -hmm. You've seen Hollywood just go on strike about the use of AI, but still that hasn't stopped some of the studios, you know, using some of the imagery of uh, people for an uh, altogether other purpose. Uh, so I, I think... Uh, you know, every aspect of our life is going to change dramatically over the next five years, not just with AI but with robotics. Driverless cars are going to change things dramatically, you know, just the consumption. You'd look at, you know, the biggest selling car, and correct me, Hans, if I'm wrong, but I think the biggest selling car in Australia now is Build Your Dreams, right. a Chinese electric car. You know, I got smashed for cutting the subsidy to General Motors, the business subsidy to General Motors 10 years ago. And we could see that Australia was not going to be building cars into the future. I mean, now it's just a whole new ball game. I just want I to mean, be clear, though, Joe. You're, you're, by and large, you think these technological leap forwards are good for humanity, Yeah, of course right? they are. And, and they're, they're, they're unstoppable. But, the quick, but AI specifically is, is a whole new realm. It's sort of like, you know, uh, uh, you know the research with, with Dolly that... The sheep. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to put some guardrails around it in this instance. Otherwise, the, the impact on the community is dramatic. The second question it was, was on intergenerational. Yeah. Sort of so measured every government, I think it's every six years we delivered it. It was a great initiative of the Howard government and Peter Costello. And what you do is you, you forecast out 50 years and you look at the impact of everything on the budget. So when I released my intergenerational report, one of the things I did was close the unfunded military superannuation scheme, which was going to be $50 billion of unfunded liability by 2040, from memory. And, uh, and I just said, look, we, ca we can't do this. I can't do this, you know, to the future. And uh, so we closed the scheme, set up a new scheme. But we've used it for pharmaceuticals. We've used it for a range of different things. And what it does is it's a reality check. You know, it's a reality check for the nation. It's done independently by the Treasury, independent of the Treasurer, the Chancellor, and uh, it's a bloody good initiative and other countries should follow it. Friends in, caucus, in Congress said they were going to follow it, but they never follow anything, really, at the end of the day. Um, Hans, I've forgotten your question. That was on, uh, will the US actually default? Well, that's right. Yeah. Um, well, I'll just refer you to the rating agencies which have downgraded it. Does that just make? I mean, does that just make debt harder? And it bear, we were talking about how it will accelerate. You said it makes speech. it more expensive. Makes it more expensive. But there is, is it... a risk element. Yeah, there is a risk element. I look. Oh, you know, the US. Sorry, what's that? Could Brexit salvage it? Could Brexit salvage it? The Brexit. Oh, the BRICS. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, de-dollarise that. Look, I don't know about you know. I mean, you want liquidity. You want. Certainty, you want stability with currencies, relative. And I think the BRICS initiatives and the Remimbi are a long way from it. So, so the, the beauty of the US dollar is that it's, you know, it's so liquid um, and, it's, and it's so universal. Um, and... Easily printed. Oh, easily printed, yeah. Well, but um, it is. That's the problem. They print too much. Um, yeah, in terms of... It, uh, there are so many other factors that come into play. Um, you know, the US spends more on defence than the next 12 countries combined. I mean, US consumption has a material impact on the rest of the world. US capital markets are still by far the most important capital markets. 59% of newly invested capital in the last year. Yeah, and so it's, it's still the safe haven. But the risk of default has unquestionably increased. Yeah.
We have overrun our time by a few minutes, not by as much as the British government continually uh, overruns its budget deficit target, I should hasten to add, but still by a smidgen. Uh, so let me thank uh, everybody who's watching us online, either live or on repeat. Please hit the thumbs up. Uh, click like and hit the subscription thing, then you'll make sure that you don't miss any events like this ever again. It's good to have you <coughs> with us, online folk. Thanks to our audience for being with us in the room. If you've, uh, if you've still got time in your evening, please join us for another drink, which will be served across the way. Uh, thanks to our donors, because there is no such thing as a free drink. Your drink is merely unpriced. It is not free, <laughs> and it is thanks to our donors uh, that we can serve you. But most of all, uh, please join me in giving our most sincere thanks to Joe Hoppy for a brilliant speech. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>